You are watching Fuel Motivation. For more videos, be sure to subscribe and turn on post notifications. I fell on my ass. I, I thought I got the top of Mount Everest, and Mount Everest just fucking slide right underneath me, man. I was like, God, dog, I got to start from scratch again. Scratch became my friend, literally, man. So, you know, that's, that's how you put in the book, man, just going up, going down, going up, just a real raw version of how my life was in the... It was so in depth to go back through your life with a fine tooth comb that I almost got embarrassed to even put it out there to people. That's what you don't understand, man. Like, even me right now to talk to you, I'm in the car for a fucking hour getting pumped up because I'm I'm a shy, introverted, leave me alone type of guy. Like, I'm still that motherfucker who is six years old, you know, at a play who can't say his line because I know I'm gonna stutter in front of five people. So I walk off the stage. That's still me. So every day I'm fighting that dude. So people think, oh my God, man, you're on a podcast. You look so crazy, so evil. No, I'm trying to be locked into Joe. So my mind isn't very off saying, let's run out the damn door. So I'm not sadistic, man. I'm focused on what I have to do to stay locked into the game of life. And that's what, and that's what I tell people, man. I, I, I go there. I go there. I, I'll tell you this. I started really realizing that when I started overcoming myself, I started getting around these real alpha males, these hard, hard men. And I... I always put people way above me when I was growing up. Like, my God, they had to have a lot more than me to get to where they're at. And a lot of them did. But once you get around the, the best of the best of the best people, you can kind of start breaking them down and realizing, man, you, you're just as fucked up as me. Like, like we all have. <laughs> but all you did was you hit it better. Your, your, your upbringing, your mom and dad, your society, the way you were raised, it hit it better than, than, than mine. You know, I can't hide. Going through buds, I was only black. You can't hide. But I started realizing just because I look different than you, a lot of you motherfuckers can't hide either. So it started giving me courage through watching people that we all have a story. We all have a jacked up life in one way or another. Some of us don't have the guts to talk about it, though. And that's where I found the guts to talk about mine. And I look at it as, as, as psychological warfare. And that's where I started learning that, that life is one big psychological warfare that you play on yourself. You play on yourself, man. The most important conversation I ever had my, with, is, is with myself. And the shit I was telling myself was so fucked up. It was so wrong. It was so misguided. And other people start to write that dialogue for you also. And it starts to be what you say to yourself every single day. And I started creating a whole nother warfare. A whole nother battle started becoming. I was like, oh, hang on a second, Goggins. You have these tools. You have these tools. Your life was basically the perfect the perfect grounds for training for where you need to go in your life. Uh, learning disabilities, all the struggles, it was the absolute perfect training ground for you to go to where you need to go. And that's how I started looking at my life versus woe is me, poopy pants, kick a rock down the street mentality. It was, nah, God just hooked you right the fuck up. He hooked you right up, man, with the perfect place. You were training for the first 18, 19, 20, you were training for this stuff, man. You have the advantage of everybody else versus, my God, they're so above me. They came from a great family. Mom and dad love them. They didn't have a learn. They didn't stutter. They didn't struggle. No, man, your struggle is what made you who you are now. So I started flipping this into a whole different. I started being a master of what I was scared of. I was scared of my mind. And I became a, literally a master of that mind. And that's what now, from now on, it sets me apart from most people. I started diving into that point. And when you're, when you're in all the muck and you're just walking in muck and walking in muck and walking in muck, you don't see that if you look off to the fucking left of the muck, there's a sidewalk, brother. Get off, get off of it. You, you have your head down looking in this muck. Once I saw the sidewalk, got the sidewalk, I got a little break and I got a different vantage point. And then from the sidewalk, I found a cliff, then I found a mountain. I got way up high on top of my life and looked back down on it and said, okay, I gotta figure this out, man. I'm not going anywhere. I'm starting to lie, I'm starting, like, so when you have a messed up foundation, I started lying about everything. I wanted people to like me. I wanted to be accepted in some society of life, some social society, and I, and I, I was like, man, this isn't the right way. I messed up here, I messed up here, I messed up everywhere. And so I realized the worst thing that happened to me is I lost myself. I never had myself. I never found myself. I had no self-esteem. So I knew through working out and through learning, because it, it took a lot for me to learn also, I started finding self-esteem. Once I found that, 
That's when doors started opening up. I, started, I stopped caring about people, that what they thought, being judged. Wow, if I say this, if I started right now, are you going to make fun of me? I stopped caring about that. And that's when my life started really changing for me, slowly but surely. One of the things psychologists have done for the last 20 years, especially the social psychologists, is push this idea of self-esteem. You should feel good about yourself. And I think, why would you tell someone 20 that? It's like, you should feel good about who you are. It's like, no, you shouldn't. Why should you feel good about who you are? It's like, you should feel good about who you could be. That's way better, because you've got 60 years to turn into who you but could. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't have confidence, but like often you take young people, say they're 16 to 22, and they're not really feeling that good about who they are because their life is chaotic and in disorder and they don't know where they're going and they don't know which way is up. Because it has to be stated with precision. It's like, it's like you, should, you should treat yourself as if you're valuable, especially in yes. potential. But you should concentrate on who you should become, especially if you're young. And so let's say you're miserable and nihilistic and chaotic and depressed and all of that now, and you have your reasons, you know, terrible parenting, all of those things. It's like, well, you should feel good about yourself. It's like, no, no, it's, it's, not, it's not the right message. Is that it's more like you should understand how much potential there is within you to set that straight. And then you should do everything you can to manifest that in the world and it will set it straight. And that's better than self-esteem. It's like, you're, you're in a crooked, horrible position. Okay, fine. There's a lot of suffering and pain associated with that. Yeah, you can't just feel good about that because it's not good. But you can do something about it. You can genuinely do something about it. And I think all the evidence suggests that that's the case. So I'm telling, telling young people, look, there's no matter how bad your situation is, I'm not going to pretend it's okay. It's not okay. It's tragic, tainted with malevolence. And some people really get hurt by malevolent people. Like, you know, terribly hurt. Sometimes they never recover. It's really awful. But there's more to you than you think. And if you stand up and face it with, with a positive, with a, with a noble vision, with discipline and intent, you can go far farther to overcoming it than you can imagine. And that's the principle upon which you should predicate your behavior. And I think that one of the things that's really nice about being a clinical psychologist is that this isn't just guesswork. Like one of the things, we know two things in clinical psychology. One is truthful conversations redeem people. Because if you come to a clinical psychologist whose worth is salt, you have a truthful conversation. The conversation is, well, here's what's wrong with my life. And here's what caused it. You know, maybe it takes a year to have that conversation. And both of the participants are doing everything they can to lay it out properly. Here's how it might be fixed. Here's what a, a beneficial future might look like. And so it's a completely honest conversation if it's working well. And all that's happening in the conversation is that the two people involved are trying to make things better. That's the goal. Let's see if we can have a conversation that will make things better. Okay, so we know that works. It does make things better. And then another thing we know is that, well, let's say there's a bunch of things that you're afraid of that are in your way. So you have some vision about who you want to be. Maybe you have to, you know, you want to be successful in your career. So you have to learn to talk in front of a group. It's like, okay, well, you're afraid of that. It's like, no wonder you don't want to be humiliated. So, okay, so what do we do about that? Well, maybe we first get you to speak in front of one person and then three people, you know, for five minutes and then for 10 minutes, like graduated exposure to what you're afraid of. Voluntary graduated exposure to what you're afraid of is curative. And that's true. It works. The documentation is in. It's how people learn. So, so to, to, to tell people that if you confront the world forthrightly, if you speak the truth and you expose yourself courageously to those things that you're afraid of, that your life will improve and so will the life of people around you. Like, as far as I'm concerned, that's as close to undeniable fact as we've, as we've got. And it also dovetails nicely with the underlying archetypal stories, the heroic stories. It's like, go out there, find the dragon, confront it. It's a dragon, it might eat you, it's dangerous. But it's worse to cower at home and wait for it to come and devour you. Go out there, confront it, get the gold, share it with the community. It's like, yeah, it's the oldest story of mankind. Okay, now what Ratzinger is hypothesizing is that the person in and up, you know how you, the idea, the modern idea is you're supposed to accept yourself. I think that's an insane idea, by the way. Really, I think, I can't think of a more nihilistic idea than that you're already okay. It's like, no, you're not. And the reason you're not is because you could be way more than you are. And so what do you want to be? You want to be okay as you are? Or do you want to strive towards what's better? 
human beings are insufficient in and of themselves and need the movement upward. And so they need to conceptualize something like the highest good.